Well, I think what, uh, what we really need to do is have a conversation about how we're going to get all of what we've heard done. So, Malia. Sure. This is the improv part of the day, and I'm going to start with Congressman Blumenauer. And so we heard this morning, all you have to do with improv is just let go of your agenda. Here we go. Okay. <laughs> all right, guys. Okay. So federal, state, and local governments are experiencing severe fiscal challenges. And we hear a lot about the need to cut services and uh, raise taxes to get out of that crisis. This morning, we heard about alternatives, such as redesigning services and growing the economy. What is your approach to getting out of this fiscal challenge? Well, I think you had a very clear explanation of why the path we're on now is not sustainable, whether it's healthcare, energy, uh, we could have put on that defense, we could have put on it uh, inappropriate and inadequate agricultural support. There are a whole series of things that we are facing. Uh, to me, it is much less an issue of what tax we raise or cut, uh, what program is going to be uh, pruned back, but it, as um, Governor-elect Kitzhaber talked about, it is really about doing this business differently. Uh, it's one of the reasons I have some great concerns about the deal that's being uh, talked about now uh, in Washington, D.C., uh, because it's kicking the big issues down the road for the next two years, and we're going to be a trillion dollars in debt and the same political discussion. Um, one, I'm almost as old as Peter, um, and uh, uh, actually, as a, as a child legislator, I was actually uh, there before him, hard to imagine. Um, in the course of this, I've had a chance to hear many presentations. I've seen what the business community has done. I think what you've done here today is commendable. I think this is the clearest and the most productive such session. And it was fun just sitting in the back of the room listening. And having worked with seven governors, um, I think John Kitzhaber is the best attuned for the time that we face, including the other John Kitzhaber. Uh, I really am impressed uh, with what uh, the governor is doing. For me, our taking a couple of these things, healthcare, we are better positioned than any in the country to build on our strength, save money, and do something different. And with the farm bill coming up, to craft an agricultural program that works for Oregon's agriculture for the future, 87% of our ranchers and farmers get nothing. We can do better than that. It'll bring the state together, doing these things in a different way, stretching resources, and making a difference. Thank you. Anyone else want to respond to that question before we move to the next one? Over here. <laughs> Okay, we'll move on. Dan? I've got the next question. It's directed to Senator Starr. Uh, one of the big out-of-the-box sort of uh, thinking, idea, or thinking uh, areas in education is the proposal to free the university system uh, from its uh, public agency status. Our, our community colleges uh, have this type of independence, uh, and the business community supports this direction for our university system. So I'd like to hear what you think of this proposal. Well, it's one that has been clearly communicated, I think, to legislators. Uh, for me personally, I can't speak for the legislature, but for me personally, it's something that I think makes a whole lot of sense. And we should provide universities autonomy. We should allow them to innovate and be flexible, and, 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 uh, but be accountable for results. I think that's what we want to see in the expenditure of public dollars is the accountability for results. But I would also say I would broaden that conversation beyond the university system. Uh, there have been a number of us for years that have been arguing this for the same approach in, in K-12 education. Freeing schools, freeing, um, creating charter schools, creating more opportunities for innovation, flexibility for teachers, for administrators, for parents. It's the same message that we heard before lunch today. It, if it's good for, for higher ed, I believe it's just as good for our kids that need to have Lots of opportunities for, um, for increased, uh, increased education. Thank you. Uh, Speaker Hunt, do you have a view on this? You bet. I, I, 
I, I think one, one of the inherent challenges that, that really does make universities different from community colleges and, and K-12 is because K-12 and community colleges have locally elected boards. It's not an insurmountable challenge, it's just one of the differences I think we have to acknowledge. I, I think you know, President Courtney and I appointed a bipartisan, bicameral uh, higher ed task force that's done a lot of good work, been very much focused on bringing forward solutions that are going to be improve the whole, you know, not just my university or your university or Congressman Blumenauer's university, but really focus on a, a, a achievements that, that work for the whole. And that I think is critical. I also think it's critical that the legislature as, as the elected body has got to at least maintain, in addition, I'd agree with what Senator Starr said in terms of accountability for results. I think there's gotta be an accountability in the legislature ultimately around tuition dollars. Because if you look at the check that the legislature has served on tuition increases at universities, uh, tuition at Oregon universities is dramatically less than it would have been over the last 10, 20, maybe a longer period of time because the legislature, the elected officials, had a check in that process. But I think there's lots of opportunities to free up, give them more opportunities to be creative, to be entrepreneurial, and I, I think uh, we'll see action on that in 2011. Thank you. Justin? Okay. Speaker Hunt will continue with you and then others can chime in. Healthcare costs, as we heard earlier today, continue to take a bigger piece of the pie from state budgets, business budgets, and employee paychecks. What is the role of the Oregon legislature in addressing the runaway healthcare costs? Great question, Justin. I think there are several roles. One is actually something that we've been very focused on in the last uh, couple of years which is trying to remove uninsured folks from Oregon, actually get them on the rolls of insurance. Uh, we've been stuck in this cycle and it was, we had 80,000 kids who were getting healthcare, they were just getting it in emergency rooms throughout our state. The least effective, the most expensive form of care. Uh, now, because of action taken in the 2009 legislature, all 80,000 of those kids are eligible for health insurance. That's gonna pull them out of that pool. It's great moral policy. But frankly, it's gonna be good fiscal policy because all of those who are paying for private health insurance are going to have a reduced cost shift as a result of those kids and another 35,000 low-income adults uh, not, being, not, not receiving their primary care from the ER. I think we set up the Oregon Health Authority last year, which is bringing back recommendations of how to go the next step in terms of cost containment, in terms of affordability. I, I think we're gonna be looking aggressively at how we can help, especially small businesses, better pool together to purchase cost-effective care. They're getting hammered as badly as anybody uh, around our state. So we've made some important steps. I think we need to protect and defend those, but also go the next step. And I know that uh, Congressman Blumenauer and Senator Wyden and Senator Merkley and our congressional delegation are trying to give us uh, even more flexibility tools under the, uh, the federal dollars that are gonna be available so we can uh, take those next steps. I just have a thought on that piece. Um, you know, we talk about making it more affordable. We've got to make it more affordable both for businesses and for individuals. We've had that conversation before. I just like the idea that um, what business can do in terms of a deductible expense to provide health insurance, we think that it would be right if individuals could do the same thing. There needs to be a way that if insurance helps people access health care, you make it a more affordable option. And there are a number of things. Uh, mandate-free programs, an increase in, in uh, association-type health plans. But I think we have to open the box pretty wide and say, what makes it more affordable both for business and for individuals so they have that portal to access, which is really the, the insurance plan or a health care plan? Thank you. This question is for President Courtney. Wake up. Okay. <laughs> Governor-elect Kitzhopper is calling for an end to current services budgeting for the alternative of encouraging long-term thinking and continuous improvement in the delivery of public services. What changes do you think the legislature needs to make in the budget process? Is that a Duncan Weiss question? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I have the slightest idea what you asked me. You made me, me ask uh, it. Well, okay, the governor's talked about 10 years. There's some things you should know that doesn't matter what I say, it comes down to the horses. The horses being state senators and the different committees. You got a guy named Richard Devlin, and I hope Richard's in the audience because I made him co-chair of Ways and Means and he's considered as good as you can get. And I'm not saying that to compliment him as much as to set him up and tell him he better stand, he better deliver. 
and he better step up. But you got Devlin, but you got more than Devlin. If you look at the way I've attempted to structure the Ways and Means Committee and the Senate side, two of the subcommittees are going to be chaired by Republicans and Keirs. But then you get to the annual session. I don't know whether you know it or not, the state passed 71, the annual session by 68 percent. I have no idea. Yeah, somebody better clap because I have no idea how that happened. I can't figure it out. I don't understand it. But that is a phenomenal percentage of saying they want the legislature more involved. That is going to play a significant role in how we budget. Uh, we're supposed to come up with two-year budgets, but now we know we can come back next February, a week from February, to make the adjustments. You've got a, a governor who wants to try a 10-year budget. So there's a lot of opportunity, both in terms of the structure of governing now, to mess with this budget in a creative, dynamic way. But it's still going to come down to the men and women, the horses, that are on key committees. Watch out for Revenue Committee, which is a committee which has been lost. It, it wasn't lost when I first served the Oregon legislature. The Revenue Committee was the big committee. And watch for your Ways and Means Committee. It's going to be interesting to see what the House does in this, because those are going to be the horses working with the governor and his staff. They're going to figure this out. And so I'm really anxious to see that what happens. The governor said 10 years. We've got an annual session, which means we could literally somewhat pass a sort of a one-year budget and adjust it to a two-year budget. So that's where I see this. It's a structural thing, but it comes down to the men and women on those key committees. Yeah, I'd like to uh, address that. I, I think your, one of your questions is what changes that the legislature needs to have, and I think we need to have an attitude change. Um, I believe that we as legislators need to recognize that, yeah, there's a large number and way too many of our friends and neighbors and family members that are out of work, but there's still 90%, 89% of Oregonians that are working that are generously going to send us somewhere over $14 billion for us to spend, and that's a lot of money. And I absolutely believe that that is enough money to keep schools operating so we don't have the shortest school years in, in any state in the union enough money so that we don't have the largest class sizes of any class or any state in the union. That's enough money so that we can keep our prisons operating. That's enough money for us to take care of the, the seniors and those that are in need in our, in our state. If we have the attitude that we can go to Salem and we can, with the money that Oregonians generously send to us, prioritize spending and, I believe, reform some things that government does. There's no question that this provides us a huge, huge opportunity to do some reformation, uh, to changing the way we do business. Uh, but I believe that instead of talking about, oh my gosh, we got a three and a half billion dollar deficit. No, no, that's the wrong way of looking at this equation. Oregonians are generous. They're generously sending us 14 and a half, whatever the number is, billion dollars for us to, for us to steward as their representatives. And I think that's the biggest change that we need to have as legislature. All right, Dan. Okay. This question is for Representative Hanna. Uh, although Oregon ranks 28th in incarceration rate, Oregon spends significantly more per inmate than most other states. Uh, some have suggested that we need to cut the correction funding by about 30%. The governor's reset report makes a number of recommendations, including modifying Measure 11 sentences, renewing and expanding earned time policies, and permanently suspending Measure 57 to save cost. Uh, these types of changes would appear to be a heavy lift politically, uh, given the recent uh, relatively broad public support for Measure 73. Will the legislature take on the issue of reducing correction costs, and what opportunities for cost reduction do you see? Well, that's, a, that's a good question, obviously. It's, it's interesting to me. We talk about corrections reform. We talk about governmental reform. Um, in, in the broad spectrum, corrections reform could be anything from sentencing to the facilities to staffing to employment costs um, and on and on. Finally, we have, to, we have to get with Director Williams and I've spoken with him one-on-one uh, -on -one to address the issue and try to come up with solutions, but we've got to get to how do we keep Oregonians safe and at the same time provide the level of service within corrections that works. Um, I spent time in the Ways and Means Subcommittee on Public Safety. I've been through those budgets. I've toured our correctional system. One thing I like to remind people of is it isn't the state prison system, it's the Department of Corrections. Uh, we heard the governor-elect talk about what do you do to keep people from getting there in the first place? Critical um, piece of the conversation. The second is when they're there, what is the correctional piece? So I think the, the legislature has to look at how do we provide the services that Oregonians believe are correct given the sentencing authority and statutes that are in place? And how do we also transform people during that time of incarceration 
therefore providing the corrections so that they don't come back.